Um, we're going to start our, our first panel, um, so I'll welcome our panelists in just a moment, and I just want to introduce um, the moderator of that panel, uh, who is uh, my friend Jennifer Rogers. Uh, most of you actually probably know Jennifer because you probably wouldn't be here without Jennifer. Jennifer uh, is my predecessor as the executive director of CAPI and is truly the reason that CAPI is the impressive center that it is today. I mean, she really took nothing and, and built this incredible something. Um, I am internally grateful that uh, Jennifer uh, gave me the opportunity to take over, but also that she left Cappy in such tremendous shape um, for me to jump in. Um, so Jennifer uh, is continuing to teach here at Columbia. So she's making uh, law students smarter every day. Uh, and she's making all of America smarter every day because she is a legal commentator on CNN and she shares her extremely thoughtful commentary uh, with so many of you, so I'm really thrilled that Jennifer is able to, to share those thoughts with so many people. Um, she's a former AUSA in the Southern District of New York. Uh, she was the chief of the general crimes and organized crime sections. She was a litigation associate at Cravath, small little law firm here in New York. Um, she was a law clerk in California, uh, and she's just a tremendous lawyer. So we are thrilled to have her moderate this first panel. Um, and perhaps I could ask all of our panelists to come down and we'll get started for that. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to get us started because I promise you will want to hear so much from this panel that uh, Barrett's going to have to come out with a huge hook to, like, you know, take us all away, I think, in the end. Um, so I'm going to do very quick introductions of our panelists, the, uh, the fierce females of, uh, of ethics, ethics experts in enforcement. I'm going for some alliteration as well as... Uh, Pointing out it's, a, it's an all-female panel, which is fabulous. Um, so I'll do some quick introductions. Then each of the panelists are going to give us a very short, say, three to five minute uh, summary of what their office or agency does, just so everyone's on the same page with um, what they bring. And then instead of doing what so often happens at events like this where they speak for longer about what they do, maybe with a PowerPoint, what we're going to do instead so that everyone I think will get more out of this is um, uh, the panelists are going to talk about something that they think that they do particularly well in this space and then something that's a challenge for them. And so then we'll have some cross-talk amongst ourselves, kind of commenting on those issues and at the end, we'll open it up for questions from you all. So uh, I'm going to introduce, starting with Carolyn Miller, who is here to my immediate left. Carolyn is the executive director of the New York City Conflict of Interest Board. She's been in that role since 2016. She previously was the chief uh, of enforcement at the COIB. She also spent time as a deputy bureau chief at the New York State Attorney General's Office and at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, as well as in private practice. Uh, Gemma Calvet, to my right, is the director of the Transparency Agency of the Metropolitan Area of Barcelona, Spain, since 2015, since the beginning, I think. Were you the yes. first director? So she got that going. Um, Gemma is also a professor, and she's been uh, a member of numerous ethics uh, committees. Uh, she also has served in the Parliament of Catalonia, so she brings us a little bit of a political flavor. Maybe she'll, she'll talk about that a bit. Um, to my far right is Elia Armstrong. Elia is the director of the Ethics Office of the United Nations Secretariat. She's been in that role since 2015. Uh, Elia has more than 20 years of experience in the fields of governance, public administration, and organizational ethics. She served in various capacities at the UN since 1999, uh, and also with the government of Canada and uh, various NGOs. And finally, to my far left, is Marianne Kammerer. Marianne is the program director of Building Bridges. It's a research center at the Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So you can see we have a, a wide variety here of, uh, of, of folks from different places all over the world, which is terrific too. Um, prior to joining UCT, Marianne co-founded the international anti-corruption NGO Global Integrity, and she serves as a trustee of the Global Integrity Trust. Um, she also has headed anti-corruption research at the institution.
Institute for Security Studies, uh, and she's had also many, many appointments in the ethics field um, in a variety of capacities. Uh, Marianne is also a member of the CAPI Advisory Board, and she has been on the board since the, the very beginning, so I thank her for her service to CAPI as well. Uh, okay, so let's get started with the quick three to five minutes on uh, what their agencies do, and we will kick off with Carolyn. So what is, is this okay? technology? So uh, I'm the executive director of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. We're a small government agency in New York City. Um, just by way of background, the predecessor agency to my agency was called the Board of Ethics, which was created in 1959. So it's uh, the agency that I work for has a very long history in city government. That agency, the Board of Ethics, only had authority to provide advice had no enforcement power. And in the late 1980s in New York City, there was a series of very serious uh, financial scandals involving city government, as well as a constitutional challenge to the structure of city government involving something called, then called the Board of Estimate. In reaction to these two things happening at the same time, there was a city charter revision commission. They, there was a real serious reworking of city government, including the agency that I work for, the Conflicts of Interest Board. At that time, in 1989, the voters approved for the board to have enforcement power um, and uh, other changes to the structure of the board. So the, the board, in its current form, has existed since 1990. It has authority over every single city employee, the mayor on down, all the elected officials, including the district attorneys and um, t teachers, et cetera, which is about 350,000 New York City employees. We deal with sort of classic um, conflicts of interest issues. In other words, some conflict between your city duties and your private interests, an outside job, uh, financial relationships, accepting gifts. We're not an anti-corruption agency in the classic sense. We have no criminal prosecutors. We don't do our own investigations. The city's Department of Investigation does that. We're really much more about um, ethics in a, like a small E way, just the integrity of the functioning of city government on an individual case by case, person by person basis. Um, we focus most of the effort of our agency on giving advice and providing education, although we do have a, a robust enforcement program. We try to you know, prevent conflicts of interest before they occur. And that's the conflicts of interest board. Great, thank you. Gemma. Okay, five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, because uh, for us, uh, it's very important to be here in CAPI to participate in this forum to promote uh, the integrity in a panel of women who have been a reference for me for years. Their professionalism and determination reflect the leadership spirit necessary to continue advancing in the ethical dimension that reforms compliance with the law. Transparency International, Bloomberg and CAPI are global benchmark that accompany us in our local transparency policies. To begin my speech, I would like to reflect a realistic view, not optimist, <laughs> that I call the wall of transparency. Secondly, I will explain the work experience of the Transparency Agency of the Barcelona Metropolitan Area and its model to promote, promoting public-private integrity throughout the code of ethics and conduct. Okay, those of us who have been working for years on the paradigm of transparency have had them to make a great effort to sustain confidence in this new dimension of public administration. When we come to establish a realistic balance between the efficacy of our struggle against the prevention to corruption and for the democratic generation by strengthening compliance with the law and the impulse of public-private administrative responsibility, we find ourselves caught up in an obstacle race and a logic of continuous paradoxes that undermine the certainly in transparency. The Lawrence Eddy program, signed by we and the Paris City Hall, the Beauduria in Bogota and the Montreal Authority, has enabled us to create a shared working framework in which to analyze these difficulties and continue our work. 
The incorporation of the paradigm of transparency and good governance has been achieved via three axes. Active publicity, citizens' right to information and public private administrative responsibility through the ethical leadership. In short, the main challenge of transparency is to build a continuity between law and ethics and between the public and private sectors linked with the need to strengthen the democracy system from the bottom up. This far-reaching reform has been accompanied by the modification in Europe due to European Directive on Public Contracts of the new contractual regulation, which have become much more stringent in order to consolidate profound changes that can advance democratic regeneration and the prevention of corruption. The implementation of electronic administration also serves to provide juridical safeguards in the processing of administrative documents. By means of trustworthy public tracking, that is the difficulty to interfere with. with. This change represented a response to the outcry against corruption as a factor that breaks the links between citizens and the Respublica in other words, between social perception and democratic certainty. These demands for reform imply a major upheaval in the procedures and roles at care to date, and the implementation of such reform is fraught with difficulties. The first shock in the repudiation of a vertical, highly centralized system of public administration in favor to horizontal criterion for the distribution on functions and responsibility. There is a risk that the requirements of this new direction make authorities feel that they are being called to task or that they entrenched power in under threat. And this means that day-to-day -day tasks are often subject to dynamic that obstruct change this dynamic are not new. If we go back to Bever, but they are different and subtler. As this German socialist, economist, and jurist pointed out in a very time, uh, timely analysis, there are two types of functionaries, the political ones and the charismatic ones. The first become prisoners of bureaucracy and routine, but an attitude that cool on be seen as just a symptom of apathetic, apathetic inertia becomes under the requirements of transparency a permanent antidote to the change proposed, which ever described as the fundamental demands of political action. We talk about the ethical action. In other words, the weapons to use against open administration and any explanation of its operation are more bureaucracy more confused procedures and electric systems, and more technological mazes that thwart any transformation. These weapons are often created within administrations in opposition to the work of bodies that guarantee transparency and good governance. Okay, if transparency affects the traceability of public money and decision making, it's evident that its extension and their be before to affirmative effects also affect public private dynamics and companies that sign contracts with the public administration, especially those involving service of the general and universal interest that have to render accounts of their service supply activities to the administration responsibly. In this respect, the Code of Ethic and Conduct of the AAV and its association entity, okay, also published, offer a working framework in which principles and mutual obligation are clearly identified. The big novelty is the existence of a sanctionary regime in the Catalan law of transparency this element is key to understanding that there has been a leap from a programmatic law to a binding one. Another key element is the questionnaire on conflict of interest and the register for lobbyists. 
after in the discussion I can explain more about this perspective. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. So, Alia, tell us about ethics at the UN. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, I think the mandate of the United Nations does not need to be explained to the public. Often the public is able to tell. Can you hear me? Or did you turn, push the thing up? There's a little button. Oh, I think it's on. It's on? Okay. Uh, I think the members of the public often know even better than those of us who work inside the United Nations. Um, but you know, we are, as I often say, in the business of providing public goods and public service at, in the international arena. And when you look at the lofty mandates that were given to the United Nations, we are in the field of peace and security development and, of course, hu um, human rights. So where within all this does the UN Ethics Office fit in? Well, the, one would have assumed that this office would have been created at the very inception of the United Nations, but actually we were created in 2000, at the very end of 2005, and I think there were a number of reasons perhaps that I think I also heard of echoes from Carolyn. You may uh, have heard of the um, Iran oil for food scandal, and there were also some um, sexual uh, exploitation and abuse problems back in um, around 2003-2004. Also, it was around that time that the UN Convention Against Corruption had been uh, debated and also adopted. So, of course, the UN was put on the spot to practice what it was preaching, especially as a guardian of this very important convention. So the office was born, and uh, currently uh, there are 13 of us we cover 38,000 staff across the world. Um, and our overall uh, mandate, as an independent office, I report directly to the Secretary General, and um, our overall mandate is to assist the Secretary General to make sure that UN staff and personnel observe the highest standards of conduct expected under the UN Charter, particularly political independence and impartiality. So the, that overall mandate, and you notice that the member states still hold the SG accountable for that. That main responsibility was not necessarily given to another office, but it translates into five things. We do um, mostly, uh, well let's say last year we did had 2,000 requests, and so our first um, uh, mandate is to provide confidential ethics advice, which is about just under half of all of our requests. We do financial disclosure for about 2,000 people uh, within the UN Secretariat and 6,000 worldwide, including some of the other agencies that come to us. We do um, ethics uh, training and outreach. We also do whistleblow in tandem with our Office of Investigations, whistleblower protection, and then we do what we call a policy coherence across the UN system. I also wear another hat. I'm the chair of the Ethics Panel of the United Nations, which is comprised of the Secretariat and seven funds and programs. And I'm sure there'll be other questions later. Great. Marianne, tell us about the program. Great. Thank you. Um, it's such a privilege to be here. Thank you to Rose and to Barrett and to Jennifer and all of you. Um, I'm sort of pinching myself. I actually made it to a Global Cities Conference because it's such an exciting. Event. So I work at what is now called the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance <clears throat> at the University of Cape Town. Formerly, we were the Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice, and our focus is very much on strategic leadership for Africa's public sector. And we were honored last year to be able to honor the centenary of Madiba's birth when he would have turned 100 in July 2018. And Advocate Tuli Maroncella, our former public protector, was there to help us as we took on the mantle and the name of becoming <clears throat> the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. You can call us the Mandela School at UCT, but really having this um, name allows one to really try and emulate and embody um, President Nelson Mandela's commitments to rule of law, constitutionalism, equality, radical social justice, and Pan-Africanism. And so we're an African school located in South Africa. We run a graduate program 
with a full-time master's program coming into effect next year, a professional master's program, mostly aimed at mid-career um, public servants from around Africa. We have executive education courses, and then I'm the director of Building Bridges, which is our leadership development platform. And we run a range of leadership development courses um, where ethics is a key component. Um, really having worked in the anti-corruption field and with global integrity and PhD on corruption and reform in democratic South Africa, laws, institutions, necessary, not sufficient. Leadership is the critical ingredient um, and ethics needs to come back onto the agenda. Um, so corruption is good, but ethics is vital. Um, and so that's what we're really doing at the Mandela School is that each of our programs has a core leadership component and an ethics component, and I can talk more to the ethical leadership program shortly. Thank you. Great. Okay, so let's, uh, let's dig into what our panelists are, are doing really well and what are challenges for them. So um, I'll start again with Carolyn. Um, and you were going to, I believe, talk about your quick responses for requests for advice, the attorney of the day hotline. So uh, let's hear about it. Yeah, one of the things that we're most proud of at the Conflicts of Interest Board is to be able to provide quick uh, advice on the application of the Conflicts of Interest Law to specific situations, which means that in practicality, we assign a member of our you know, uh, five-person uh, advice staff every day to answer calls from the public or emails coming through our attorney of the day uh, email account, and they will get legally binding answers for their conflicts of interest questions that same day, either on the phone or by email. Um, there's a handful of kinds of questions that are too complicated or require the five-person board, but we're generally providing very fast advice. We answer dozens of questions every single day like this. Um, it enables people to move forward. The accessibility of that advice, it's, it's confidential advice. The person can... Um, share that advice with whomever they want, but the Conflicts of Interest Board can't let anyone know, even that the person contacted us to seek advice. Wow. So, and you do that, so this, what I wrote down says 400 and 500 requests a month? Right. So that's, uh, my math is bad, like 515 a day or so, and so the person on duty is able to handle all of those questions in a day except, like you said, when it needs to go to the board or something like that? That's exactly right. So we're like reallocating the, the resources of the staff that wouldn't be handling, a, let's say, a, a written matter, a more complex matter, to be spending the majority of their time each day on that day just answering these rapid-fire kinds of questions. Great. Um, so that seems to me to be really important, the ability to respond very quickly to people's questions and not hold on to these things for weeks and months and let people kind of uh, sit out there. Um, does anyone on the panel have a comment on that? Um, maybe yeah. Aaliyah, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think I find that very impressive because uh, this is one area that I do talk about with uh, my staff in the office. We get the order of maybe through our ethics help inbox, we get in order of about four to five a day plus there may be some others that also end up in individual uh, officers' um, uh, inboxes. So I think what you're saying, you know, this is really quite quick turnaround time. We also try to give an initial response or request for additional um, uh, information within 48 hours. But I think one thing that we've learned is to, um, to uh, manage expectations of our clients because they typically think that there's someone sitting there twiddling their thumbs waiting to give a conflict of interest advice and then they'll come at the last minute and uh, because they want to do an outside activity, let's say a public speaking matter, and they'll say, you know, I have to go tomorrow, can you just tell right. me now? Right. So, so I, I find that very impressive. Yeah, you need the attorney of the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about that. Yeah, that seems like a great idea for everyone. Um, I, can we hold till the end? Is it <laughs> about all right, all right, let's go. I just want to say quickly, um, precedent is a binding response. Mm -hmm. I can read those the IRS, the SEC, FINRA, all these organizations. If we'll tell you something, they'll say, don't go. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's amazing. 
Awesome. So everyone will be having an Attorney of the Day program <laughs> instituted to me to see we're making progress already. Excellent. Um, and then, Carolyn, uh, you told me that your, your challenge is reaching everyone with the training and education component. I know that there are some 325 thousand New York City employees, many of whom don't sit at work at desks where they can be reached by online training easily, right? You have Parks Department employees running around and, and all sorts of people. Uh, so that, I think you said, was your biggest challenge. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you, you think about, right, there are sanitation workers who work, uh, you know, garbage collectors who work overnight and obviously don't sit at desks. There are city hospitals. Uh, that function on night shifts and people who are nurses don't sit at desks and teachers have very strict schedules where they don't have an extra 30 minutes in the course of their work day to sit down and do training. So we, we work very hard to try to shovel in 15 minutes, but you know, it's, I'm, I can't send one of my staff members to be at 3 a.m. in a sanitation garage in Queens doing a training. Um, that's not practical, but that's the challenge to reach. There, it's so many people, even though the city itself is obviously geographically quite compact, so there's not the challenges of, of long distances to travel. It's just actually getting humans into a room. There's um, m more online training that happens now, as most people are familiar with, with basically any kind of educational program that's reaching employees, but even that is challenging for people who don't physically sit at computers. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe Marianne, since you deal a lot with teaching people how to, to lead and to train and so on, do you, do you have any thoughts about this? Is there uh, any programming that you know of that would maybe be helpful in trying to reach some of these hard to reach uh, employees? I mean, what I'm stuck about is that we're operating at all sorts of different levels here, sort of across UN agencies sanitation workers and queens at 3 a.m. in a warehouse. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the challenge, and that's what I wanted to talk to later, is how does one scale up these interventions and what sort of resources are available to, in a sense, sort of train the trainer and have resources which can, can get to people if they're not going to have that one-on-one -on -one legal advice. I was involved in setting up something called the Open Democracy Advice Center in South Africa, which looks particularly at access to information and whistleblower protection laws. And, you know, we were getting about 100 calls a month, but, you know, we're back to whistleblowing, which in the South African context is, is pretty lethal. So it may be too late by the time someone has got advice, they may actually have been bumped off. I mean, that is the reality. So how do you make these resources accessible, safe, um, responsive, yeah, we as the Mandela School don't have that, but I mean the critical role of NGOs, um, such as Transparency International Corruption Watch in South Africa plays that role. Great, so, so Gemma, you had talked about with your agency, uh, when I asked you about something that you do, you're doing well and you're proud of, you talked about your code of ethics, which is mandatory, um, and also a component of it that I found very interesting, which is uh, a conflicts questionnaire that you send out, which is not mandatory, right? So not everybody responds, but it, um, it is an interesting thing I haven't seen before where you send out to everyone this conflicts questionnaire that they can then send back to you um, that will help kind of tease out some of these conflicts and also has a training component too because it kind of teaches them about what conflicts might be and what they need to look out for. So um, can you talk a little bit about that program? Yeah, okay. Uh, we are a holistic model uh, for public-private integrity where the code of ethic of senior officials are in the center, okay, but is complementary to the other programs. It's very important, this vision, of integrity, integral policies of transparency. But really, our code is, a, is a, an instrument that uh, shock with the traditional culture of the uh, administration seniors and uh, private, and sometimes private seniors too, because uh, our law, uh, it's very, uh, it's very, um, Exigence, exigence with the uh, stringent. yes, stringent. stringent. Okay. Now, 
in our questionnaire for the prevention of conflicts, we have four levels. It's very simple, but it's very clear. There are four levels, economic interest, professional activities, relationships with employers, and final statements. Uh, we put in here only the different uh, questions uh, that provide from the law. It's not new. It's the uh, reflex of the legality. What is the, the moment about that? Okay, really, we have 166 uh, senior officials that uh, sign this adherence and the conflict um, questionnaire. But we, can, we have 110 that know. Okay? The strength for us, the fact that 110 senior, uh, ten, sorry, my English, 110 senior officials have not subscribed the code does not mean that they are not concerned. In fact, they are concerned as well at the signature, but it, in these cases, the agency don't know about its possible conflicts of interest because they have not fulfilled the questionnaire. Our, our question now is, how we must do about that. There are two perspectives. One, intensive reaction with the sanction, with the skirted at the moment. Now we are prepared one important questionnaire, an interview, personal and confidential, with each one to ask why they don't want to uh, add it in the code. For us, it's very important to explore this dialogue, this uh, capacity to uh, explain them the importance, uh, uh, the importance of that to uh, prevention of the criminal risk. Mm -hmm. Because on the other hand, there are the criminal uh, risk uh, with the cartography that we elaborated, uh, previous, and this code. So uh, if they don't want to sign in uh, six months after we must uh, we must use the sanctionary system because our law uh, is, um, decides that this is the way okay this is I don't know if I, you understand me uh, but this is the perspective of, uh, of us it was very revolution this code why because there are private law in the companies, and there are a lot of discussion with them about what is the limit of our pol transparency policies. Why the private world must talk about the integrity with the public system. Why? And we explain because the law design one uh, perimeter, a new perimeter of the public private integrity, but on the other hand, we work together. It's important uh, belief in this uh, work together, and the, the way is together. Is for that is important. This paradigm, the public-private integrity, an holistic perspective, but with the sanction, with the last uh, recourse. So, um, Carolyn, I wonder if you can comment on this. The COIB isn't so much of the the kind of private-public partnership that Gemma was talking about, but in, in in terms of this, this conflicts questionnaire, I'm, I'm, I hadn't really heard of it done that way before. Um, and I wonder what you, what you think of that, this notion of sending out this questionnaire to the, you know, they send it only to the senior officials. You certainly couldn't get it to your 325,000 New York City employees. Um, but have you, have you heard of this before as a way to both educate and also tease out some of the conflicts of interest and, and what do you think about it, at least in a place where it's feasible in terms of the, the number of people? Right, it's, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, certainly the, the kinds of conflicts of interest access that the highest, like that elected officials, the 51 city council members receive is different from, you know, lower level city employees who don't really have the same uh, access to contracting and other potential conflicts of interest, so that's appropriate. It's, it's, it's uh, New York City is such a um, 
bureaucratic bureaucracy, so like more forms frightens me. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, luckily, I guess, uh, the conflicts of interest law applies to every city employee, whether you agree to it or not. So um, they don't have to sign anything. It just uh, applies to them. And some agencies have requirements internally where people have to report any outside jobs, any outside volunteering activity, um, regardless of whether that uh, second position might arguably violate the conflicts of interest law. And I am of two minds about that because I think there's a value in uh, government employees also having private lives that their employers don't know about. And uh, if there's no legal violation that people can just sort of exist privately and there's no conflicted conduct. So sometimes some of those things that seek information from people have uh, unwanted effects. Do you think there's any benefit, I mean, I, I, or actually let me ask you this way, do, do you, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a difference between even when you train a lot and train well, telling people that there are issues and requiring them to come to you kind of on their own with right. conflicts versus, you know, putting a piece of paper in front of them that actually requires them to think and be like, oh, well, yeah, I actually did take a job the other day that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, do you know of any agencies who do that kind of affirmative seeking of information about it from um, their people? Well, uh, you frame it that way. That's, that's essentially what annual financial disclosure is, which is, uh, uh, about 9,000 uh, city employees on boards and commissions and elected officials and people who do contracting and uh, high-level managers uh, have to file once a year a disclosure form that lists property and loans and gifts that they've received in the prior year, relatives and city service, and other things that hit on various potential conflicts. And we, we receive those, we review them, and we often identify, well, you have a position at Columbia University. Columbia University is a firm that has business dealings with New York City. You need a waiver for that position, and then we reach out to them to try to get them into compliance with the conflicts of interest law. So th there is that kind of mechanism, and the city's disclosure system has been around for decades. Jennifer? Yeah. yeah. If, if I may. Yeah. Please. Actually, in the United Nations, um, back in 2016, we introduced what we call a pre-appointment uh, declaration of interest which is very much like what Gemma is describing. And um, I think she was describing it in terms of risk mapping for a very high, highly visible, therefore high risk uh, population that, that her office covers. And, and what we realized in dealing with our senior officials, and we have about 180 of them that would be equivalent to say political appointees in a national jurisdiction, um, that uh, uh, by the time they've already come to the UN and when we're giving advice and we would say here divest of this uh, you know asset or um, resign from this they would say you know had I known that I would have maybe not taken this position and it's also very difficult once they're on board then to ask them to do these things because sometimes they take time etc cetera, etc cetera. so we have now introduced this thing mm -hmm. where when we have candidates at the very last stage um, and you, the timing of it is a little tricky. Sometimes it's just prior to the appointment. Or sometimes it's like right after uh, um, the uh, appointment is announced. But uh, we give them a, a, a lengthy questionnaire where they declare their interest, and then the ethics office, you know, we we negotiate with them, you know, about what they're willing to divest of, you know, and put those measures in place. And I think that's really one of the most effective things. I have to say, you know, um, uh, and I'm very happy about that. And I would recommend that if your if your laws allow it, I would recommend, you know, that kind of thing. Great. Um, so, Gemma, when I asked you about a challenge that you're facing, and there are all sorts of challenges with a new agency, right? Um, but you mentioned independence. Yeah. That, um, uh, and I, I'm not sure whether it's that. And sometimes these agencies are set up with compromises, right? So I don't know if it was set up in a way that requires more independence or just as you've gone along, you see that there are areas where you feel that you need more independence. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you, you face in your agency with respect to independence? Good question <laughs> and difficult answer. Uh, because in a diplomatic perspective, I must say, okay, yes, I am <laughs> an independent service. But really, it's not clear. Why? 
because uh, the budget, the use of the budget is clear. If you have not a judicial personality, you have not independence. If you depend that, uh, of the another service in the big structure uh, to decide uh, who contracts you to implement it, this code, for example, or uh, what is the um, decisions about the sanctionary questions. Uh, for example, now we have one, one in three years, only one uh, expedient to uh, the conflict of interest because uh, there are one senior official that not uh, declare that his daughter uh, works with an enterprise that he contracts directly a lot of times. Okay? It's very difficult for us to uh, work in, uh, without autonomy uh, and a status juridical uh, that uh, protect the workers, our workers, and the service. It's a tension. At the beginning, I believe that this model is okay because you can change more into the structure than outside. But now, after four years, I propose uh, to the president, Mrs. Colau, that uh, we need a uh, status juridical uh, like an independent agency. Mm -hmm. Really, I think that if we want to be effective, we need autonomy and uh, a responsibility and a very uh, near work with the other and an attitude to the prevention more than uh, persecution. This philosophy is clear, but it's necessary to be autonomy. I don't know if I, <laughs> I, yeah. I answer no, your I mean, question. Uh, certainly independence and autonomy are one of the key things in any sort of integrity watchdog agency. Um, do you have thoughts on that, Marianne, given how much you study these types of <laughs> entities? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just writing a few things down, which one was professionalism, which obviously would embody independence and discretion within a rule of law context, but also how crucial context is. Um, in the South African context, politics is, is everything. Um, and so we call it political administrative interface, and it gets a bit confused, but when you're trying to build a developmental state to deliver services to people on the ground, um, you know, there's professionalism and then there are party political agendas. <laughs> um, and so we work very closely with a former national director of public prosecutions who has the constitution, which is written in blood, as his Bible. And he, this is advocate Vuzi Pakoli, um, he was then suspended by former former president Mbeki because he brought charges against our minister of um, our chief of police and also against our other president Jacob Zuma and he was kicked out for prosecutorial, prosecutorial independence and as far as he's concerned he is not the comrade who has betrayed the values because the constitution as a framework and for professionalism and independent prosecutorial service, he's upholding the law. They have betrayed those values by, by trying into, to interfere in quite established processes. But, I mean, context is crucial um, and politics is, is, is functioning, whether it's at local government level or um, national government level, international organizational level, and how to what we call navigate and walk the fine line um, with integrity. It requires enormous courage and, and resilience and, and solidarity. I liked what Huguette, when she mentioned solidarity, because with our ethics training that we do with senior officials from the government's Department of Justice, we ran a training course for them in November, literally it was a safe space to let it all hang out <laughs> in a highly customized, facilitated process. Um, people were able to share and get a common language and build some resilience. As one person put it, I, I grew a backbone just by being in the class and being able to share what some of the very, 
very real challenges are. Um, so, Aliyah, you um, talked to me when we were discussing something that, that you wanted to kind of highlight as doing well, your um, ethics training, your annual face-to-face -face ethics training, and then you do this really what, what you described as a cascading leadership dialogue, which I thought was fascinating. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. Um, obviously, when you have a very multicultural organization like the United Nations, you know, it's 193 nationalities represented there, all coming with different um, sets of their personal level beliefs and so on. The role of education is extremely important when you're talking about standards of conduct that is expected uniformly. Um, and so uh, we have so many online mandatory um, training programs. However, you know, um, to have a real ethics training, I think face-to-face -face discussions are very important. So this is not something I can take credit for, but my predecessor had come up with this annual face-to-face -face leadership dialogue, and we're into the seventh year. So every year, um, a ethics topic is chosen, and uh, it is rolled across uh, the secretariat. And so I think in the first year, we had something like 16 or 17 participants but last year we had 32,000 participants and last year we tackled the uh, theme of um, speaking up uh, when does it become whistleblowing and um, this year uh, we're going to roll it out it will be uh, on the topic of conflicts of interest why do they matter and so it starts with the Secretary General and his own office then each of the heads of entities then get together with their senior managers, and then the senior managers go down, so on and so forth. We give them between three to four months to conduct, and then we ask them to hand over the signing sheets and uh, any comments or feedback that they will have. And I think this is a very powerful uh, organizational culture tool. Yeah, I, I hadn't really heard of it done that way where you say the cascading, you kind of rely on the, the people below and at the same level to do it and then report back that, that it's been done. Um, Gemma, do you have any thoughts on that? You've, you've kind of had to stand up your training and, and figure it all out. Is, is that an idea that, that might work for you to kind of try to rely on some of the, the uh, other agencies to do it or do you think it's best done by the folks in your agency given your expertise? I don't understand well the question. You can explain. Oh, I was just asking what, whether you had thoughts about the way that the ethics office in the UN is conducting this training by relying on um, their their other components to do it and then reporting back. Is that a way? Because it's a resource saving device, right? Oh, okay. It helps. Is there is there something in that that you think might be helpful in Barcelona? Uh, is that something you can see doing, or do you feel that your training has to be done by the folks in your agency because you know you're the experts and you really want to impart it in the right way? I think it's important the resource, the network. It's clear. It's a global way. I think uh, we talk uh, ever that uh, the the new century, democratic century, is ethical. Or there is the risk that not be. <laughs> Uh, and it's very important for us the personal synergies and the uh, informal uh, coding interchange programs, ideal reflections. We are all time in contact. In Lorenzetti program with Paris, with Montreal, with Bogota, the, the, the last uh, three years, we are in contact each month, mm -hmm. each month. We talk about uh, our different approach, and we uh, imported mutual uh, the different programs. Yesterday, with the support of uh, Elia Armstrong and the uh, office of the ethic office of the unit, I, 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 I can explain, but I can recite too, because uh, really, for example, in Spain. Uh, there are only one area metropolitana, it's our area. We have 36 municipalities, it's very important, in eight areas in Europa, okay? In, in the world there are more, but in Europa eight, and in Spain only this one. Uh, it's a model of administration that believes with the 
collaboration because each municipality are autonomy legal um, and, and administrative autonomy. So this is spirit of collaboration in the work of the integrity is necessary. Uh, now we are one network in Spain with different bodies of guarantee that we decide uh, the same that in the Lorenzetti program uh, we have meetings each three uh, months together and we talk during one year I went day about our progress our budget our difficulties and our uh, experiences I think it's very important this methodology informal and formal that's great so you're learning a lot from your okay similar yeah similar um, folks in other places um, so Elia the the challenge that you mentioned to me was whistleblowers how to handle whistleblowing. You want to, to, to frame that up a little bit for us? Yes. Again, given the multicultural uh, situation that I explained, and of course the, the notion of whistleblowing can be even confusing, um, you know, in those countries where they have more of a tradition of that, but in other countries and cultures, the notion of reporting wrongdoing on a colleague or a friend is extremely foreign and very uh, distasteful. And so to have to explain that it's an obligation under our legal system, it's an obligation for international civil servants to disclose through internal channels and then through exceptional means, through external channels, um, misconduct and then wrongdoing uh, that would be uh, detrimental to the operations and the reputation of the United Nations. It's a difficult concept for people to, to have and so we need to really work on that and then I guess a corollary of that is for managers to understand that they should not be the front line of retaliation but they should really be the front line of protection because it is really you know you want to hear about it from your staff before you read it in the newspaper the next day and it's trying to shift that mindset um, that we find quite challenging. Yeah, whistleblowing is a major challenge for everybody, right? No matter where you are. Does either of you have any thoughts about that? I just want to commend Kathy just um, on your website. You have amazing resources. And one of them was which um, Kelly Richmond Pope um, with her TEDx video, Why Do We Hate Whistleblowers? <laughs> um, that landed incredibly well in our ethics training in South Africa. And of course, the bottom line is everyone who did blow the whistle and survived would do it again because of you know doing the right thing. I mean, it was really well put together and it's an amazing resource. Also, when you were saying Elia, about um, the leadership dialogues and you know conflict of interest and why does it matter, it reminded me of I had a visit to Mark Davies when he was on the Global Integrity Board, but he was also head of the Conflict of Interest um, New York Board Board of New York. And the sort of material which you have been producing, which is literally 101, what is a conflict of interest, is so crucial. I don't think we can assume that people actually know. And you've mentioned some of you know the challenges of an international organization, but sometimes just having, you know, scenarios, video material um, which are shared like like that are really useful. And one last resource, which I couldn't ignore, it's also been amazing for our work, and Adam Graycar was able to refer us to it, is the Education for Justice. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime have got this extraordinary series of lecture material, videos, you know, really it's it's there, it's available, it's free online, and it's it's been really, really useful for our work, so thank you. Okay, so um, Marianne, when I asked you about something that you were doing at um, the Mandela School that's working well, you talked about your executive training and you alluded to that a little bit earlier. Um, tell us a little bit more about that and um, why you feel it's something that is worth sharing. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes the whole problem or challenge of corruption seems overwhelming and when I was working with Global Integrity, it was how do you just get some sort of visual snapshot of what's going on? And we developed something called the Integrity Scorecard. So literally on, on, on one piece of paper, you could see 
350 indicators and you could rank and you could see you know, what's working, what's not working, and then you could have a dialogue and a discussion. And with our ethical leadership and public accountability course that we've been developing over the last three years, is really working with those sort of tools which, which allow their sort of integrity assessment tools. So it's almost an expert assessment of the colleagues who are in that training to be able to agree what's working, what's not working, where are the strengths, where are the opportunities, where are the gaps, so that they don't have the sense of helplessness, that there's some sort of way, okay, well, let's focus on conflict of interest or on whistleblowing or strengthening this particular oversight mechanism. So that's a sort of matrix which we've, which we've been working with. And I think by the participants doing group work and self-populating that model around these three dimensions um, of an integrated integrity system, a resilient ethical culture, and effective accountability instruments, it just gives them a picture of of, because it's not a one-off solution and it's not just one thing. It's this whole thing and you don't want to get completely overwhelmed, but if you can see it and share about it and then have a path forward, and that seems to have worked really well. I mean, it's, and this is the challenge. How do you scale up from a training of, of 30 people to 32,000 senior officials? And we're, we're, we're working on that. but. And that gets to the challenge that you identified, yeah. which is the scaling up. And yeah. you talk about the, the political situation in South Africa and how there's a loss of trust and trying to get people to even believe that any of this matters and any of this can change is a challenge. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Um, it's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I... I did just find a newspaper article just to bring it home. And since this is a global cities conference, um, we have a situation at the moment, and this is just one of our metropolitans, where the mayor of Etiquini, has anyone ever been to Etiquini? That is also known as Durban, Durbs by the sea, so not Cape Town, but Durban. But the mayor of Etiquini, Ms. Sandile Gumedi was arrested recently in connection with a 208 million rand waste removal tender, so also at city level dealing with waste. She was subsequently released on 50,000 rands of bail. Um, later, she was put on a 30-day suspension by the head office of the African National Con Congress. Um, she happens to be the regional secretary of the ANC, um, her deputy regional secretary and fellow councillor, Mr. Mondly Matemba, was also arrested over the solid waste tender fraud. And the Newcastle mayor, um, who's out on bail for the alleged murder of an ANC Youth League official, they were also required to step aside for 30 days. And what happened on the streets of Durban earlier this week is that Ms. Gomerdi's supporters who include former President Zuma, who himself is fighting over 700 charges of corruption related to an arms deal, which looks positively like peanuts compared to the allegations of state capture. Her supporters marched on the city centre to the ANC offices demanding that she be reinstated as the mayor of Durban. So you have a mayor who is, would not have been arrested had there not been really serious allegations at local municipal government level around fraud and corruption, who's out on bail, and then her supporters would say she needs to be reinstated. And, and so there's the, there's the politics of this, and then there's the political will to deal with and fight corruption and the contestation within side political parties. And there's hope. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, three formidable females have been appointed to head the National Director of Public Prosecutions, a new anti-corruption agency. And, you know, we're about to start seeing some, 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 some high-profile arrests because the first thing which was captured under what is now referred to as the lost dec decade of the Zoom administration and the hollowing out of the state were the criminal justice agencies. Um, and that filtered down. So, so, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this all day long, but somehow focusing on ethics, focusing on leadership gives one some hope because you're building human capacity and supporting people who have retained 
their integrity in very difficult circumstances and supporting them now with the criminal justice system coming on board. Great. Well, on that note, let's take some questions from the audience. We have a few minutes here for that. We have a wealth of knowledge up here. Surely someone wants to, to tap this, whether it's about New York City, South Africa, Barcelona, the UN. LA will, will answer questions about any nation that is part <laughs> of the UN. So no matter what you're interested in. Um, all right, well then I'm, I'm gonna ask, um, see if Carolyn has any thoughts about what Marianne was just saying. You know, New York City is, is often described as almost a one-party town. Like one of the reasons in the city we don't have a lot of this political stuff is, you know, there aren't a lot of Republicans around. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't politics involved in trying to enforce ethical standards. Um, what do you think when you listen to Marianne? Do you think, you know, thank goodness we don't have people marching to City Hall to do things like that? Or do you think, gee, I still have politics involved even if it's not on the same scope? Uh, well, the first thing I thought was um, uh, the, the, like, the, the kinds of like, uh, uh, desperate ethical issues that we deal with are like city employees who want to take free tickets to Yankees games. Not mayors <laughs> being arrested for huge multi-million dollar contracts. And I just think like the, the righteous indignation of a person who can't take a free Yankees ticket is, is, uh, is, is quite powerful. It's just the, the benefit of having been around for a long time and like the, the sort of luxury that one has of being a part, having been a part of city government for, for decades. And so that has a challenge because we're both known and then uh, you know, the use of ethics as a tool in political, because even though New York City is mostly Democrat, you know, there's only so many high level um, elected positions and there are term limits in New York City. So once you hit your second, the end of your second term, you're looking for, if you're elected official, you're looking for your next job. How do you distinguish yourself from the uh, 15 other Democrats who are gonna be running for that same position? And uh, so ethics is, it can be weaponized in the political context. And we have the challenge, uh, when Jem was talking about transparency, that you know we have very, st the built into our law is strict confidentiality rules. So if someone asks us a question, we can't tell anyone else uh, that they asked or what the answer was. So when people call us and say, reporters, how come you haven't done anything about X? Has the mayor checked with you about doing X? And we can't say, well, even if the mayor has asked us, and we can't tell you whether the mayor is violating the conflicts of interest law or not, because we have to, our, we're so invested in being a safe space for people to get advice that the only way people will be confident that they can get advice is if we're not gonna share that advice with anybody else. But the flip of that is that we can't say, oh, we said it was okay, and we're on top of this, and we're covering it. So there's always that balance between um, transparency and individual access to legal advice. And that's something that just in, even in a all democratic town um, or mostly democratic town is a challenge because people want to say, hey, is that guy doing it correctly? Mm -hmm. Again, n not with multi-million dollar contracts though. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, for everyone, but I think for Carolyn and Alia in particular, do you find that there are trends in terms of the questions that you're getting um, and, and the inputs that you're hearing? And in terms of that change between the two? Oh, good question. Alia? Um, yeah, to some extent, for example, uh, now we get a lot more questions about the use of personal social media accounts, for example, and that you wouldn't have seen as much, say, 10 years ago. And so, yes, we do have to include that into our training. Um, and when we have also talked with our investigations office, it was very interesting. They actually did some charts where they showed that, you know, we would run a training, let's say, on sexual harassment uh, or, you know, on other things, and then there would be a spike in reports, mm -hmm. and they were able to show this, like, so it was quite interesting to, to see that and to take some comfort that it is raising awareness, you know. <sighs> Wouldn't it be nice if social media were just a trend? Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any thoughts? Right, I, I would say, right, the two, the two trends, one, the social media, because we have uh, strict rules uh, that you can't use city resources, so email accounts, computers, uh, city social media, for political activities. And what political means in a world where people feel like 
um, you know, speaking out against an elected official because they're engaged in immigration policies that they disagree with? Is that political or is that like about a policy? And so how do we think about what political means in the world that we're living in right now? That's a big challenge. And the second one is sort of the gig economy stuff, um, where there's strict rules about city employees having second jobs and what it means to be driving for Uber or selling your book on Amazon and those kinds of just like sort of technical things about thinking about how those kinds of positions might conflict with their city jobs. And yes, we try to address trainings to, uh, to think about those things. Great. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, we always take our colleagues back to the charter to say that, you know, and really for the United Nations Secretariat, we don't deal so much with uh, huge amounts of money. We are in the business of articulating international norms and getting consensus around those things. And so political risks are very high for us. And for us, the notion of political independence and impartiality is a daily reality for us. And I think what can be a little bit confusing for colleagues is that um, the idea as an international civil servant that you have to implement a collective decision of member states or you know a subset of those that the member states have agreed to, whereas of course a lot of member states are interested in influencing, and it goes a little bit to your point, Marianne, you know, um, are interested in finding their nationals and then sort of, you know, trying to influence that. And, and it seems like innocent enough because after all, we are all citizens of our countries and we feel, you know, a, a tie to that. And one of the big things that we must always emphasize about the United Nations is that now we serve the international community. So. Great. One more question? No? Well, I kept us pretty close to on time. <laughs> pretty close, pretty close. Um, please join me in thanking these, this phenomenal panel.